Many had billed this date on the calendar as a crowning moment for Germany's rotating EU presidency and for its outgoing chancellor before her final months in office. So how will Angela Merkel, a fixture for so long on the European stage, weather this summit that couldn't be more crucial? Would Hungary and Poland find a loophole around rule of law conditions to European aid or even blow up that landmark COVID stimulus plan the rest of the continent's counting on? What lasting damage then for Europe's street cred? Spoiler alert, in the past minutes, we've had a deal. We'll ask what's in that compromise, the hard-fought spending package, an ambitious response to a pandemic. It, uh, for the first time, includes the mutualization of debt and borrowing at the EU level. It was also seen as a way to turn the page after the UK's departure. There, too, there's unfinished business, what with injury time Brexit trade talks casting a long shadow over a summit where the UK is not even on the official agenda. Fact is, we still don't quite know how strong EU institutions will be going forward in a post-Brexit, post-Trump, post-Merkel world. Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at a summit that could be seen on the European stage as Merkel's last hurrah. Joining us uh, from Ghent in Belgium, member of the European Parliament, Sophie Entfeld from the Liberals' Renew Europe bloc and from the Democrat 66 party in the Netherlands. Thank you for being with us. Hello, good evening. From the Polish capital, Michal Baranowski, director of the Warsaw office of the German Marshall Fund think tank. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Great to be with you. From Brussels, we welcome back Dominika Kozic, correspondent for Polish Public Broadcaster, TVP. Nice to see you. Good evening. And our very own Brussels correspondent, Dave Keating, is on, is on standby, the France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24debate. Dave, uh, talk us through it. We've had in the last minutes word that... Uh, uh, there is a deal with Hungary and Poland. Yep, uh, Council President Charles Michel just announced this deal. We had a feeling going into the summit because uh, reactions to the compromise brokered by Germany were fairly positive on both sides. Uh, so assuming this is the same compromise that was on the table, which I've just been told by a new source it is, uh, so it's a, there's two main things to this. They have added language to this rule of law mechanism that greater specifies when it would be used. And the kind of more important thing is that it would give Poland and Hungary a chance to challenge the mechanism in court at the European Court of Justice before the mechanism could ever be used. So it essentially grants the two countries a reprieve of two or maybe even three years before this mechanism could ever be used. That is, by the way, it takes Orban's Fidesz party straight through till past the next election. Uh, so it's, uh, we'll see reaction coming into this. This still has to pass the European Parliament. They're not happy about their mechanism that they worked so hard on now being picked apart. Uh, but from what we heard from the prime ministers of the most pro-rule of law countries coming in today, uh, they don't see this as a major dismantling of what they added in to the budget and worked so hard on. Because it's all about, Sophie Enveld, conditionality. Yes, you can get funding, but in exchange, you have to respect basic principles of rule of law, uh, including uh, respect for an independent judiciary. Uh, did one of the two sides blink in this compromise? No, I, I actually, I, I think I should make a little correction to the uh, report we got just now, because the, the, the law, so the rule of law conditionality mechanism, uh, that has not been changed, because that has been uh, agreed between two legislators, the Council and Parliament, and has not been changed. What we are talking about here is um, the Council conclusions, which is a unilateral statement on how to interpret the law. And they're free to do that, but that has no particular legal value. What is worrying here and, and what is concerning to Parliament is that these Council conclusions also uh, seem to give instructions to the European Commission, the custodian of the treaties, uh, on how to enforce these rules. And indeed, uh, they seem to foresee a period in which the rules will not be enforced. And that is, of course, unacceptable. Uh, on, the, on, on the basis of the treaties, the, count, or the Commission cannot take instructions from anyone. 
Uh, and when a law has been decided and adopted, and when the law says it will enter into force on the 1st of January, then, you know, not a thousand council conclusions are going to change that, unfortunately. So uh, the law will simply apply from the 1st of January. Sophie, just to remind our viewers, you're from the Netherlands, one of the countries that when this historic landmark uh, a stimulus plan was tied to the uh, next budget cycle back in July, uh, said, OK, we'll go along with it, the 750 billion euro plan. But in exchange, you know, there have there ha countries that uh, apply more and more illiberal policies have to be called to task if they then use the funds and promote policies that are contrary to EU values. Are, are, are you confident that uh, you're going to get what you wanted as far as that goes? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm not representing the Netherlands. I'm a member of Indeed. the European Parliament. And, and in that role and with my political group, the Renew Europe group and previously the Elder group, uh, the rule of law has always been one of our prime concerns. And for many years already, we have been calling for this kind of uh, tools in the rule of law toolkit. Um, uh, it can be a very strong tool, and I think if, uh, uh, if, if, if it weren't a strong tool, then Hungary and Poland wouldn't be making such a fuss about it, would they? Uh, at the same time, uh, any legislative tool is only as strong as the, the, the political will to also apply it. And that's why I, uh, I stressed very much, and this is, this is a sentiment which is uh, shared by many of my colleagues, that... Uh, you know, the council is, of course, free to adopt any statements and conclusions that they like. But that doesn't change the fact that the law will enter into force and the commission will have to enforce it from the 1st of January. That does not change. Michel Baranowski, you agree? Again, I'm uh, also I'm in a good position of just uh, telling you about the debate here in Warsaw rather than representing the government. But I think um, the government will be, the Polish government will be happy with the compromise because they needed a face saving solution from a position that was very, very difficult for Poland, both within the European Union, but also for the government um, domestically. As a two years reprieve, at least that's how it's going to be sold here, uh, opens up a space for, for the government to claim uh, success. Um, the other aspect where I would probably somewhat uh, dis I'm sorry, disagree Michel, is on the claim, strength of Michel, the mechanism. Le, Michel, the you're mechanism saying, Michel, you're saying claim success or is it success for Poland? Oh, they will claim success. The government will claim success because sooner or later, whether it's on January 1st, 2021, like uh, Sophie is saying, or after the European Court of Justice decides, the mechanism will come uh, into force. So this is, this is just a postponement that will be certainly used if Poland continues to um, uh, bend or perhaps break uh, rules uh, pertaining to judicial uh, independence and, and rule of law. Now, the concern of about half of the uh, population here in Poland or half of the political spectrum that is that is um, uh, critical of the government is that in fact this mechanism has been softened it's been softened by uh, by the German presidency it's been softened um, at the European level and it you know the rule of law is specific to the way that the funds are being used so it's not necessarily as wide as many in Poland would like to see, uh, but certainly much sharper than the government would like to see. All right, so the, 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 a, a, lot, a lot of people you're saying in Warsaw wondering uh, if uh, Germany's EU presidency hasn't perhaps softened its stance. Uh, that brings us to Angela Merkel. In 15 years of EU summits, how many times has, uh, has she heard that this one is a crucial one, the German chancellor stepping up to the microphone uh, as this rule of law issue uh, hung in the balance when she arrived in Brussels this Thursday. 
Und äh, es wird sich heute zeigen, ob wir dann auch eine Einstimmigkeit im Europäischen Rat dafür finden. Wir haben jedenfalls versucht, viele Vorarbeiten zu leisten. Und es wäre natürlich ein sehr wichtiges Zeichen auch für die Handlungsfähigkeit der Europäischen Union, wenn wir dieses wichtige ähm, Ergebnis erzielen könnten. Dominika Kozic, your thoughts on, on uh, uh, Angela Merkel's position and uh, do you think, do you, do you uh, agree that with, with those that are worried that perhaps the EU has uh, softened its stance too much? I know that it is a position of uh, some member states, uh, but for Poland uh, this deal is, uh, was also quite difficult because you should know that in Pol uh, Polish government uh, there is a split, kind of split, because uh, uh, we have two different positions. From the one side you have Minister of Justice who would like uh, to be to be more for veto than a prime minister, and you have uh, Prime Minister Morawiecki, who is uh, more ready for the compromise. And uh, so it means that Poland made a big effort to, uh, to achieve this deal. So I think that now, for Pol from Polish point, point of view, it is quite a good solution. But you heard, Polish you heard Michel, uh, you heard Michel the, Baranowski saying how uh, this allows them to save face, but little more. Okay, I, I will try to say a little bit more, uh, more uh, lower. Yes, uh, for, uh, for the Polish government, it is quite good compromise. Of course, it is a quite a difficult situation because uh, in Poland, public society is quite divided in this issue. But uh, we understand also that compromise needs uh, kind of the sacrifice and the goodwill from the both sides. It means from the Polish side and also from the German, Dutch and other countries side. And uh, now as we have this compromise, uh, which is just has just done, it's uh, for Polish uh, voters it's quite a good sol solution because uh, we have avoided to veto. And from the other side, of course, you can complain. Some countries, member states can complain that it, uh, maybe German presidents came too far uh, uh, to be close to the uh, closer to the po uh, position of uh, Poland and Hungary. But from the other side, some people, some politicians in Poland complain that Polish Prime Minister Morawiecki and Hungarian Prime Minister Orban, they came, they made uh, too much uh, to achieve this compromise. So, uh, situation, it is, uh, I think that uh, in contrary to some people, I would say that it is win-win situation when we have all uh, achieved this agreement and it will be good for the EU. Right, let's listen to the Polish Prime Minister, Mateusz Morawiecki, uh, calling it unfair when he walked into the summit before the final compromise was reached to be mixing, on the one hand, this landmark budget agreement and rule of law issues. Where is the line of demarcation between the budgetary control and all the anti-corruption and anti-fraud uh, regulations? Mixing the two creates a very dangerous situation where politically motivated, motivated premises may, be, uh, may stand behind the mechanism of attacking any country. Sophie Infeld, your reaction to those words? Yes, well, you know, the, the Polish and the Hungarian governments are, are, are playing the victim and they are pretending that this is in some way against their country. It's quite the opposite. Uh, the vast majority of Hungarian and Polish people are very, <coughs> sorry, pro-European. They're also very attached to the rule of law. They support the rule of law conditionality. And ultimately, in particular in Hungary, um, it is the, let's say, the, 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 the regular, the normal Hungarian people who are actually uh, being penalized for the corrupt behavior of Mr. Orban and his government. Uh, so ultimately, I think the Polish and the Hungarian people will benefit. They are Europeans. Uh, we are all in one family. And I would like to underline something else, because there's a lot of talk now about uh, uh, compromise and, and deals. Uh, I would like to make one thing very clear. You can negotiate about money and you can negotiate about uh, deadlines and those things, but you cannot negotiate about values and you cannot negotiate about the rule of law. Uh, and I don't think that it should be interpreted in that way. 
Uh, and I also think that the European Commission would make a big mistake, Mrs. von der Leyen would make a big mistake if she feels that she can take instructions from the member states to spare Hungary and Poland. The Commission has been sparing the Hungarian and Polish government for far too long. So we expect the Commission to just apply the law as it has been adopted by the legislators as of the 1st of January to the benefit of the Polish and the Hungarian people. You heard Michel Baranowski earlier, Sophie, uh, say how the opposition in Poland thinks perhaps Angela Merkel is going a little bit soft uh, on, yes. on Warsaw. Yes. There are perhaps historical reasons for this, Germany's past relationship with Poland. Is it true, though? Do you feel like it's that way that Merkel did go soft on, on the polls this time? Yes, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm afraid so. And I have to say, I am a big fan of Angela, Angela uh, Merkel, but I mean, she's not infallible. You know, she's human like the rest of us. Uh, and yes, I think with regard to the Polish and the Hungarian government, she's made a mistake. Uh, I suppose in the case of Poland, it's because of, you know, historic relations. In the case of Hungary, uh, it is uh, about um, uh, German industry interests in, in Hungary. I mean, by now we've seen, we've seen the media reporting about how the, the German car industry has very strong uh, uh, financial interests in Hungary and, you know, they're interfering in this whole process. And that is one of the reasons, in addition to the fact that Mr. Orban belongs to the political family of Mrs. Merkel, uh, why uh, Orban has been able to destroy uh, the rule of law in his country for such a long time. And I think the EPP family, the, the Christian Democrats that both Merkel and Orban belong to, I mean, they have something to, to answer for because, you know, we wouldn't be in this situation if they had been a bit more strict. And we're going to pick up on that point when we come back. Stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. Uh, it's the last EU summit uh, with Germany holding the rotating presidency of uh, the European Council. And as such, well, after uh, nearly uh, 16 years on the job, it's Angela Merkel's uh, last one where she is front and center. And uh, there's been big compromises struck, particularly when it comes to that landmark uh, budget uh, that includes a stimulus plan with uh, the mutualization of debt. Uh, there had been uh, worries that uh, Poland and Hungary uh, might veto uh, those. Uh, they've struck a compromise uh, this Thursday evening. We're talking about it with a uh, member of the European Parliament, Sophie Inveldt, from the Liberals uh, Renew and uh, the Dutch uh, Democrat 66 party. From the Polish capital, Michel Baranowski. He is uh, the director of the Warsaw office of the German Marshall Fund think tank. Uh, Dominika Kozic, who is Brussels uh, correspondent for Polish uh, state broadcaster TVP. And uh, France 24 uh, correspondent uh, Dave Keating, who is also with us from the Belgian capital. Dave, just before the break, we heard Sophie Intveld uh, uh, saying, yeah, Angela Merkel um, has gone light and on, on, has gone easy on the Poles and the Hungarians. And she points most notably to the fact that you have uh, Viktor Orban's uh, Fidesz party, which has been suspended but not kicked out of uh, that uh, big voting bloc in the European Parliament, the EPP, where the Christian Democrats belong. Yeah, this has been an ongoing dispute within the EPP. Sorry, I lost my microphone there. It's been an ongoing dispute within the EPP that they've tried to settle. Donald Tusk, who now leads the EPP, has been trying to get Fidesz out. Uh, but I think we have to sympathize a bit with Angela Merkel here because it's true that Hungary and Poland have the EU a bit over a barrel here. They were holding to ransom something actually unrelated to the rule of law mechanism, which was this COVID recovery fund. And as long as they have that veto power over the whole budget, this was going to get very complicated. Yes, they could have separated 
operated the uh, recovery fund out of the budget and approved it with just 25 of the 27 countries um, through enhanced cooperation. But that was going to be legally very, very complicated. It was not a desirable outcome at all. Everyone I talked to in town said that was really, really problematic if they were going to go that route. Um, so I think Angela Merkel had every incentive to try to find a compromise here. I think Sophie makes a good point that the mechanism itself has not actually been touched. So this is an interpretive statement, uh, and it's it's all about the interpretation of the mechanism. And a lot is going to depend how exactly the interpretive statement is interpreted. And a lot of the prime ministers, I understand tonight, made the point that they want the mechanism legal text to take precedent in any kind of legal dispute over uh, that interpretive statement, which it probably would, because the interpretive statement is not as strong uh, doesn't have as long, strong backing in legislation. Uh, so it could be that this interpretive statement, as, uh, as being suggested here, it doesn't actually end up meaning a whole lot. It just gives Orban a cover to say that he, he had a victory here. Um, so it, it, a lot is going to depend on the, in the next years. And I think when people look back on this compromise, I'm not sure that they will blame Angela Merkel so intensely or think that it has to do with Germany's connections uh, to Poland or to Hungary. But I guess time will tell. Time will tell indeed. Uh, and patience is wearing thin. Uh, in uh, par other parts of the continent uh, with uh, Hungary and Poland. Uh, let's give an example. You had, uh, at the end of last month, Poland's outspoken education minister. Uh, he, he gave an interview uh, on this rule of law issue, and he said, uh, we have reached worse, the worst level in Europe than the Soviet Union and communism, because in Soviet Union, Office workers did not believe in Marxism, even though they were doing everything under pressure from Marxists. Those people, he's referring to, uh, I guess, Eurocrats, truly believe in Marxism. They are neo-Marxists, postmodernists, and they do not tolerate the truth. Uh, when you're on the receiving end of that uh, kind of criticism, Dominika Kozic, is it any wonder uh, that you want then to play hardball with the Poles? I think that we should distinguish, uh, make distinctions between uh, this mi particular minister and Prime Minister Morawiecki, because uh, this minister, it is new minister of uh, education, Mr. Czarnek. He is uh, very well known from his controversial and very radical point of view. And uh, if I can say this, he is not representing all law and justice, uh, especially uh, this uh, government of my, um, Mateusz Morawiecki side because uh, it is a big difference because between his rhetoric and the rhetoric of uh, Polish Prime Minister Morawiecki. So uh, we should not uh, put him to the, to the one shelf uh, together with Prime Minister Morawiecki he, because he was particularly talking but, but, in his own name, not in the name of the government. But Dominika, there, there seems to be, according to Le Monde's correspondent in Warsaw, a bit of an an ecosystem now where you're seeing in the Polish press, in the pro-government press, more and more a virulence and anti-EU kind of statements. Uh, uh, is there a problem then you, with a country that is a net beneficiary of EU subsidies to be blasting the EU in such a way? You know, I think that the situation is more complex uh, because uh, there is a rumor about Polexit uh, that Poland would like to leave EU. But who is talking the most in Poland about Polexit? It is not law and justice. It is Polish opposition who claims the government, who blames government that the uh, government would like to, to leave EU. But uh, the government knows very well that majority of Polish citizens is accepting our membership in EU and is happy with our membership uh, in the EU. So uh, no one uh, serious politician from the law and justice is thinking about Polexit. It is a kind of speculation. And uh, you know how media works. In our country, you have uh, a small controversial title and articles you have. Unfortunately, it is, uh, you have a bigger chance to sell very well this newspaper or some uh, TV show. So, I think that we should divide between uh, media rumor and uh, real political act. And uh, 
In fact, it is the opposition who is talking the most about uh, Poleks, it was very, and the, both sides of opposition, because in Poland we have former uh, government pan party, party of Donald Tusk, Platform Civic. Uh, it is the biggest opposition uh, party, and this party is also blaming government that go government is preparing Polexit. And from the other side, you have radical far right party who says that uh, yes, maybe Polexit is a kind of solution. I think that uh, no one serious politician is in Poland is considering uh, Polexit, so it is only kind of rumor, especially now when it was this very crucial, very hot political time. Michel Baranowski, uh, do you agree that uh, the education minister only represents himself, that this is all just uh, uh, a bit of headline grabbing, or is there a drift in Poland away from EU values? Now, this is unfortunately a crucial question, uh, and there is a lot that I agree with with, um, the, with, with my uh, colleague. Um, I agree that Poland is a very European, pro-European society. We are, in fact, the most pro-European, 80% supporting membership of the European Union. Um, but it, uh, it is a real problem when the Minister of um, Education is saying this things. Yes, he is very much an outlier, but at the same time, the Prime Minister as well has given a very um, sovereignist around the issue of veto. And perhaps it, it's true that no serious politician is talking, is advocating a uh, poll exit. It would be, after all, absolutely a crazy thing for him to claim such a thing in a country where over 80% of population deeply supports uh, EU membership. But at the same time, the far right of the, or right of the political spectrum has begun uh, a debate, uh, in, first in press, but also in a, in a sort of public debate um, um, that allows, that, that, that creates an opening uh, for a conversation uh, that hopefully will not lead to poll exit. You know, again, I cannot imagine it from Polish national interest. It would be, frankly, suicidal for Poland to leave the EU, but it creates a crack for for really a very dangerous um, arguments to be made. And the, and the conversation that we are having today about values, about rule of law, about freedom of media. All this is part of this conversation, very much internal conversation that is mostly happening between the government and the opposition, but also within the government where there are, there is, as it was mentioned, the justice minister who is trying to push the prime minister in a more radical position, more anti-EU position. And frankly, we'll find out in the next couple of days whether the prime minister will not pray a political price for for this compromise that we saw today, because many uh, in the ruling uh, coalition will demand his head for for being too soft and uh, giving up Polish sovereignty. So that's the kind of debate we are having nowadays in Poland, which is uh, in fact quite quite unfortunate. All right, I want to ask Sophie Infeld uh, about uh, that other crisis that's unfolding, Brexit. But before I do, Sophie, let me just ask you, you know, the, the, the UK Conservatives, they were in the same voting bloc as Poland's ruling peace party, uh, Justice and Law Party. The fact that they've left, does that give the EU today a freer hand to sort of stare down a country like Poland on these issues? No. No, I think that's uh, that's unrelated. There, you know, there, it was very often said, oh, you know, if only the Brits were not in the EU, then, uh, you know, we could finally go ahead and, and integrate further. But that was always a myth that they were uh, blocking anything or indeed uh, uh, shielding the, the Polish populace. But I, I'd like to, to pick up on two issues that were mentioned. One on drifting away from European values. I sometimes hear a kind of false dichotomy between uh, Eastern Europe and, and Western Europe. That's nonsense. We see everywhere in Europe, we see on the one hand, 
populist forces on the rise. And on the other hand, we see pro-European, let's say, middle of the road, liberal Democrats with a small L uh, forces on the rise. But we see, also see outside Europe, we see somebody like Trump, who was an ally of the populist forces in, in Europe. So it's not, it's not an Eastern European phenomenon. It's not even a European phenomenon. It's a very universal phenomenon. And I think the pro-European forces are uh, very, very strong, and they're actually growing stronger. And the second issue is, I think the, the crux here is the veto. And I think one lesson that has to be drawn from this situation is that we have to abolish the vetoes. We cannot have the same circus seven years from now, because if you look at the figures, so there were two member state governments were against, 25 were in favor. Okay, so that's two against 25. 80% of the population of Europe supported it, and the vast majority of the European Parliament. So the veto, national veto, doesn't give any power to citizens. It only gives power to corrupted autocrats to hold the, the entire European Union hostage. So that will have to be settled before the next negotiation seven years from now. This system will have to change dramatically because it's giving power to the destructive forces. And on the issue of Brexit, we've heard the UK Prime Minister this Thursday saying there's now a, quote, strong possibility that talks on a post-Brexit trade agreement with the EU will end in failure. Your reaction to that? Well, that would, of course, be you know, tragic. Uh, and, uh, I mean... Is this grandstanding because we're in the final days oh, of it? I not, neither you nor I are, are at the negotiating table. I don't know. Nobody knows. We'll find out, uh, you know, when the time comes. But uh, we can all see that the clock is ticking. Uh, we're already way past any reasonable deadline. Um, and I think, look, I, I think what the, the Brexiteers clearly didn't realize is that when you're outside the European Union, you're actually outside the European Union. You're not the same negotiating partner anymore. Uh, and the European Union will defend its own interest. I mean, that's only natural. That's what the Brits, uh, what the Brexiteers wanted to do. They wanted to defend their own interests. Well, fine, then you cannot blame the EU for defending its interests. And I think the EU has been particularly uh, uh, reasonable. Um, so if it doesn't work out, uh, I mean, there, there are some pretty fundamental issues uh, indeed. Uh, but I think uh, everybody's going to pay the price for that, everybody. But clearly, the British people are going to pay a higher price. And I think that's very, very sad. Uh, Dave Keating, our, our, our mood has uh, shifted a lot during this, this week. Uh, how much of a cloud is Brexit um, casting a shadow on this EU summit? Well, I mean, the EU leaders were at pains not to mention it when they came in, and they couldn't be asked about it because the journalists aren't allowed inside the council anymore. I, I counted two prime ministers who brought up Brexit as they entered. So I don't know, at least on the surface, they're kind of acting like it, it's not bothering them. Of course, it is bothering them. This is a, a huge catastrophe that we are limping toward now. But what you're definitely not seeing from EU prime ministers and presidents is any indication that they are considering adjusting their mandate red lines in order to accommodate Boris Johnson. I think that that's been very clear today. And I think that's probably what motivated the statement from Boris Johnson this afternoon. They were hoping that there would be a, a uh, kind of surrender at this European Council summit today, that the EU leaders would panic and they would adjust their red lines after they saw uh, the dinner last night not work out. That clearly hasn't happened. And so there's really almost no likelihood that a deal is going to be struck between now and Sunday, it would appear, unless Boris Johnson makes the compromises necessary to get a deal. Uh, so this, I, I, would, I think the summit so far, in so much as it has really ignored Brexit, will have been a big disappointment to Boris Johnson. President von der Leyen will brief EU leaders about that dinner, but I'm being told that is not going to be followed by any kind of significant debate, and, and all 27 leaders are okay with that. Finally, bef before we conclude, now I'll go around the room. I'll begin with you, Dave. We're, we're nearing the end of this um, uh, German-EU presidency, and all these big issues have, have come up. Germany is the, mo the, the biggest nation in the bloc. It's got the biggest economy in the bloc. Having a German presidency to the EU, what kind of a feel has it had? 
Well, of course, it's it's been organized, it's been well structured, but I would say, you know, even Angela Merkel was no match for 2020, right? I mean, this, this is just a year of catastrophes. Uh, I think that the fact that they have brought this uh, whole budget soap opera to a close uh, is going to be a huge relief in Berlin for the German presidency, for sure. That being said, is it so much of a success that you've just re-agreed a deal that was already agreed in July? Uh, I'm not sure. I think I think if we do indeed go to no deal Brexit in a couple of weeks, which I think we are, uh, that is going to be a big, big disappointment for Angela Merkel and for the German presidency. Uh, she will not like it that that took place on her watch. And so I think if anyone has motivation here to try to get a deal done, it is Angela Merkel. But she has indicated in her speech earlier this week to the Bundestag that she does not believe that a deal is worth doing at any cost. Uh, and she believes just as much, I think, as Emmanuel Macron in the sanctity of this of these level playing field demands and that they can't give in on that. Uh, so this will be a big disappointment to Germany, not enough to make them, I think, uh, cave in here to the UK demands at the last minute. Uh, Dominika Kozic, uh, you, you heard Sophie Infeld earlier express her frustration over the fact that um, you have uh, th this unanimity rule on such mo momentous bits of legislation and that we could face the same kinds of problems seven years from now. Uh, your thoughts on whether the EU should have a, a mandate for a stronger leadership at its heart? I think that I am in a quite in a quite a difficult position because, uh, in contrary to Mrs. Indbert, I know her uh, very well from the European Parliament, of course. Uh, I think, in contrary, that we should keep this privilege for the member countries. I know that it is making uh, managing of the EU more difficult, but it is also the question of sovereignty of the member states. And if we erase uh, veto, it would be very difficult for uh, some other countries, not only for Poland and Hungary, to deal with this and to explain to voters that the uh, EU is based on the democratic uh, values and uh, everybody is equal. It, uh, it was many cases, of course, when some veto uh, of some member states has blocked uh, some uh, di uh, difficult and uh, very important uh, negotiations. And now we have example of veto. I know that maybe it is not uh, such important negotiations like with uh, budget issues, but we have a veto of uh, about an enlargement uh, of the EU by Northern Macedonia, and uh, Bulgaria is blocking now this uh, starting of the negotiations, membership negotiations with uh, Northern Macedonia, which is, uh, in my opinion, very negative, which gives very, very negative impact and uh, message uh, to all Balkan uh, states waiting for uh, the membership uh, in the EU. But from the other side, I think that it would be very risky for the all EU as a community if we will just uh, to change completely our system and uh, if we will block veto, possibility of veto, because it will be a really negative message for many member states, not only Poland and not only Hungary, maybe Netherlands uh, is in different situation because we, you had different history, uh, you are on a different um, uh, position now than our countries, but uh, especially for this Eastern Europe, it will be very difficult uh, to uh, to deal with this. All right, so Michel Baranowski, don't expect uh, uh, some great overhaul of EU institutions in the years to come, says uh, Dominika there. When you look back on this uh, six-month rotating presidency of Germany at the head of the European Union, did they get not much done or a lot done? Well, the ambitions were high before the pandemic set in, and I, I really like what what was said that the even even for Merkel 2020, Merkel was no match for even for 2020. Um, uh, but I think clearly a disaster has been avoided uh, at least until now, uh, and knock on wood. Um, but you know, today we are talking about. Uh, to what extent this is a success of, of Prime Minister Orban, to what extent this is a success of Ms. Merkel. The fact is that there was a possibility of uh, having two very, very bad 
uh, scenarios happening. On one hand, we could have actually had uh, Poland and Hungary vetoing the budget, uh, which would be terrible, uh, would be terrible for the European Union, would be terrible for Poland, because of course Poland benefits from the budget so, so, uh, so much. Uh, but if the other scenario went through, that we actually had the recovery fund be uh, uh, having gone into plan B with Hungary and Poland uh, being cut out, it would be also very bad for Poland and Hungary, but I would argue that it would be indeed very bad for EU because we would cre create a precedence where uh, the, the countries no longer have to agree, but can actually cut out uh, less obedient uh, or less in line members. So, you know, here I think veto is not as much of a problem as, as the abuse of the veto that we are uh, seeing, uh, the abuse that, that can create a very difficult situation that has been in, in a way uh, a little bit uh, avoided. And, you know, th there is credit here to, to the German presidency. Um, but again, this is, this is after the six months, I don't think we are in such a, you know, in a great new course. Uh, we have good news on the other side of the Atlantic, so there is an opportunity for, for new transatlantic partnership, but it's, it's been more of a muddling through a very difficult situation than, than perhaps of really putting um, EU on a strategic course that would uh, take us further in this, in this very unstable uh, world outside of our borders. Yeah, the prospect of... Uh an incoming Biden administration, uh, the Green New Deal, relations with Turkey, so much more to talk about. Unfortunately, we're out of time. But I want to thank uh, very much Sophie Infeld for joining us from Ghent. I want to thank uh, uh, Michel Baranowski for being with us from Warsaw, Dominika Kozic and uh, our correspondent Dave Keating in Brussels. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.